Let me ask you to turn tonight to the book of Genesis in chapter 39. If you go to chapter 39 of the book of Genesis. One thing we've not really said a lot about, and we've just kind of been waiting to see how things go, is our choir. We've not been able to get the choir started, and really the biggest obstacle we have to our choir is the choir loft, because it's basically a box, and if you were going to, so you can't really spread out the chairs, uh, there's not a lot of room, and we've not had any other cases, but uh, if there happened to be just one choir member who came and was standing about a foot from you and was singing over your shoulder, it could really cause us a problem, so we've not really tried to do that. We're contemplating just uh, waiting till the building gets going, so we'll just kind of see how things go. We don't want to make a definite decision, because obviously before that happens, we'll start having rehearsals and get the choir uh, rehearsing again, and so we'll be ready to go when it does happen, but kind of just communicating with Eric on that. Um, he's certainly ready at whatever time we can do that. I hate it because the choir was going really well, doing a good job, and was growing, and of course it's just the nature of things. So we'll We'll see how that goes, keep you informed about it. We may even have new folks who'd like to be a part of it. One thing we will have is more space for the choir. We were just about out of space there in the choir loft, and so we'll try to keep you informed along that way. And uh, just a number of challenges, but uh, at least the Lord is allowing us to continue on with services and so forth. As you find your place in Genesis chapter 39, I want to look at a little section here in the life of Joseph and hopefully be an encouragement and a help. So let's have prayer and then we'll begin. Lord, we thank you tonight for the Word of God. We thank you that it is truth, that we're not just reading a, a, a narrative of myth or folklore, but the very Word of God that you've recorded for us. And I pray tonight that you might take this account and you might apply it to us very directly. We pray that what we do tonight would honor the Lord Jesus and draw us closer to you. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You, of course, are familiar with Joseph being one of the tribes of Israel, born from Jacob, and of course we know that Joseph was put through a significant amount of adversity and obviously sold by his brethren and went into Egypt and of course became a lord over Egypt and a lord over his brethren, and when it's all said and done, we know how the story ends. Certainly we can make the point tonight that Joseph is a picture, a distinct picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the book of Genesis has 50 chapters, and 13 of those chapters are taken up with the life of Joseph. Uh, Joseph was not the tribe from which Jesus came, but the picture of his life parallels Christ in so many ways, we know that he was a picture in type of the Lord Jesus. I'm not going to deal so much tonight with the type, though it may come up along the way, but I want to deal with a practical part of his life that really applies to us because what happened to Joseph is going to happen really to every believer in some measure. Now, God gives us an example here, and the Bible is that type of book. When you read the Bible, there's always a, a, a literal interpretation. There was a literal man named Joseph that lived, and God recorded it because it affects the history of Israel. How did they get into Egypt to begin with for God to redeem them out? Well, Joseph was the first one to go there, and everybody came under him. There's a literal interpretation. Well, then there's usually a prophetic side, and the prophetic side is the picture of Joseph points to the Lord Jesus Christ. But no doubt, every place that I read in the Bible, there is a spiritual truth that applies to me directly. All the Bible was not written directly to me as far as the audience, but it's all written for me. And the Bible says it was for our admonition. And so we read this story and we see a very practical lesson. If God took care of his people in the book of Genesis, then God takes care of his people today. So I go into this account and without reading a lot of verses, you know that Joseph now has been sold into Egypt. He has been placed in the providence of God into Potiphar's house. Potiphar was an influential politician, and he had the ability to buy a slave, and so he bought Joseph to come in. Joseph, of course, is uh, immediately seen as an industrious young man, and Potiphar puts him over his house, and he is beginning to head up the ladder of success, and all the other servants would, of course, envy him. And even Potiphar's wife, we remember, uh, looks at Joseph and, and tries to tempt him, and he rejects that temptation. So in every aspect of his life, things are going well for Joseph. He is doing well. He's standing strong. His testimony is vibrant. But then you come to chapter 39, and you see it, and you know the story. She spake to him in verse 17, according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant, which thou hast brought into us, came in 
unto me to mock me. The opposite, of course, was true. It came to pass, as I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled out. And it came to pass, when his master heard the words of his wife, that she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me, that his wrath was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph, and he showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison, and whatsoever they did, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him, and that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. You know, I think about Joseph as he went out to check on his brethren. He was there because the Father sent him to check on his brethren. He was being obedient to the Father, again, a picture of Jesus, obedient to his Father. He was rejected by his brethren, of course, a picture of Israel rejecting their Messiah. But even so, when I think about the life of Joseph, he was doing what he was told to do. He was in the right place, really circumstances far beyond his control he sold into slavery. He makes the best of it. He does the best job he can do. He's industrious. And again, it looks like things are going well, and he's put into prison. He gets into prison, and we know from the story, we know God had a purpose for his being in prison, but you understand Joseph did not know that. God didn't come to Joseph and say, now Joseph, just bide your time. I'm going to leave you here for a little while, but don't worry. At the end, you're going to save all of Egypt. Joseph didn't know that, but even though he didn't, I read this Old Testament account knowing that he couldn't pull out the book of Psalms and find solace in the Word of God. He couldn't go to his New Testament and read the victory he had in Christ. He had very little revelation from God, but man, what a person who was faithful to say, if this is where God wants me, I'm going to serve him right here. Do you know you would do well as a believer today to say in whatever circumstances you're in that if this is where God wants me, that's where I need to be. Now, I don't doubt for a moment that Joseph prayed. I don't doubt for a moment that every day when he got up and perhaps when he went to bed, God, I'm, I'm here, I want to be faithful to you, but I sure would like to get out. Would you deliver me from prison? And you know, if you're in a deep trial or you're going through a circumstance you don't enjoy, or perhaps you're in a job that you thought you'd like to be in a different place, or maybe in a family situation that you can't control, I mean, we go through difficulties, and there's nothing wrong with saying, God, I sure would like to be rescued. I'd like some help. Could you move me? That's not wrong, but even though he doesn't move me, God, I am where I am by your providence, and I'm going to serve you right here. Now, that's exactly what Joseph did. And Joseph was effective. I look at this account, and the first thing I notice is Joseph's duty. Now, he carried out his duty quite well. You know, as we think about his story, first of all, he's framed. Now, the woman lies on him, completely untrue, and the master believes it. You say, well, why didn't God intervene? You know, if we were big enough to understand God's whole plan, I almost wonder if every once in a while, if God doesn't just let us, see what it would be like if we had our way. You know, sometimes we say, why doesn't God do this? And then God says, okay, I'm going to do that. And if we'll stop and observe it, we're like, you know what? I believe God's way was better than mine. And you know, that's like sometimes we say, don't uh, be careful what you pray for because God may give it to you. God knows better than we. Yes, I look at it and say, Joseph was framed. He was lied on. But do you know this whole plan is coming together and God has a reason from taking him out of Potiphar's house Joseph would have never been the ruler of Egypt had he stayed in Potiphar's house from a human standpoint. He would have been very important. He could have lived a nice life and retired well and said, I'm the most important slave in Potiphar's house. But that's not really a great place to be, is it? He's still been a slave. He had to go to prison to get out of prison into Pharaoh's court to be placed as the prime minister of Egypt. God had a plan, but he was framed. You know what the Bible says in Psalm 76, verse 10? God uses the wrath of man to praise him. You say, well, God wasn't pleased with the woman lying. No, she wasn't. She didn't, uh, he wasn't pleased that all of this framing took place. I mean, God, men are sinning. They're doing wrong to lie on Joseph, and God will take their sin and use it to accomplish his purpose. That's how big God is. So he was framed. Well, you know what? He was also very fortunate. Because I noticed that even though he got framed and he got put in prison, even in the midst of the prison, he was the most important guy in prison. You know, even when he got there, everything he touched, God blessed. 
Now, he didn't want to go to prison, and he didn't want to be a slave. But in both places, God so touched his life that he became the head of Potiphar's house. When he got to the prison, the keeper of the prison said, Look, Joseph, here's the keys. I know I can trust you. I want you to go feed the prisoners. I, if you would, do my job. And basically, he just stood and you know, read a magazine every day. How's it going, Joseph? Okay, good. He was just reading the Egypt Times, you know, letting him go around and do what he would do. He trusted Joseph, and Joseph was an important man in prison. He knew the prisoners. And as you read this chapter, obviously the baker and the butler, man, they they like seeing Joseph come around. Even though he was framed, and even though he was in a place he didn't necessarily want to be, he was still fortunate. Do you know God says that he is a very present help in trouble? You know, I think about in the book of Matthew, it's also said in the book of Mark, when Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and he knows that they've given up family, given up lands, houses, importance, and so forth to follow the Lord Jesus for three and a half years. They totally gave up their business. They forsook their nets. They followed him. Matthew gave up his duty as a publican and so forth. And they asked him, Jesus, what about us when the kingdom comes? I mean, we're willing to serve you. We're here, but we just kind of want to know how's this thing going to work out. And Jesus says, no man has left houses or lands or families or anything for my sake that he will not receive a hundredfold with persecutions. You know what Jesus is saying? He's saying, yeah, you serve me. That doesn't mean that you're never going to be persecuted. Most of those men died a martyr's death. But I'll guarantee you in this life, you'll still be blessed of God. And he said, not only with persecutions will you receive a hundredfold, but he said, you also get eternal life. You see, if it's all said and done, we're going to be with him anyway. God has never let a person be faithful to him that he didn't bless him. Now, I'm not talking about just financially. I mean to give him fortune in this life. The best place you could be today is to be a Christian. You know, if I didn't even get heaven, if I had to go back to dust, I'd rather be saved and live for Jesus just for this short little time I've got than live like the world lives. It's a better life to live. Hey, he was framed, he was fortunate, but he was faithful. Look at verse 6 of chapter 40. Go to chapter 40 and look at verse 6. Joseph came in unto them in the morning and looked upon them. Now, here's the baker and the butler who have had a dream. We won't read all the verses because you're familiar with the account, but they have a dream, both of them, on the same night. And Joseph came in unto them in the morning and looked upon them, and behold, they were sad. And he asked Pharaoh's officers that were with him in the ward of the Lord's house, saying, Wherefore look ye so sadly today? And they said, We have dreamed a dream and there's no interpreter of it. And Joseph said, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me them, I pray you. You know, Joseph could have looked back and said, Boy, I had some dreams myself. And when I told my brothers what my dreams were, they sold me into slavery. I'm about tired of this dream and interpretation, and you know what? I'm just going to run my job and not worry about these other people. Who cares what their dream is? It doesn't have anything to do with me. But that wasn't Joseph's uh, uh, approach. Joseph said, I have from God something these men need. He knew he had an ability. He knew that God was over dreams. And obviously, back in the book of Genesis, it was not unusual for God to uh, give instruction and revelation through dreams. And so he said, if you had that kind of dream and you remember it, tell me what it is. Let's see if God can tell you what it is. He was faithful. You know what you'll find is the happiest way that you will be able to approach a difficulty is to simply decide, I'm not going to sulk over it. I'm not going to be focused on the difficulty. I'm not just going to be constantly saying, when is it going to end? I'll pray it will. I'll trust God to give me deliverance. But in the meantime, if God has me in it, he wants me to be faithful while I'm in it. That's what Joseph did. He stayed faithful. 1 Corinthians 4, 2, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. You know, anybody can be faithful. You may not have much ability, but that's one ability we can have. We can be faithful. God's got a job for me. I need to do the job. But you know, not only was he faithful. Look over, if you would, in verse uh, 21 of the same chapter. And again, the story's familiar. He gives them their interpretation. Basically, the interpretation is one of you is going to be restored to your job. The baker, uh, the butler, rather, is going to be restored to his job. Then the baker, in seven days, you're going to bite the dust. So have a nice day. And I mean, that was the, that was the interpretation. Well, sure enough, uh, the baker dies. And then if you look down in verse 21, he restored the chief butler unto his butlership again. And he gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker, and as Joseph had interpreted them, yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. Now, 
what we find here is he gave these people this interpretation. And it came to fruition. Now, right now, uh, the butler doesn't remember him. But what we do see is the faithfulness that Joseph was able to, uh, to give ends up coming back to him in fruitfulness. Do you know, sometimes we don't see the results of what we're doing now. We see it later. God brings it back to us. So here the butler doesn't remember it, but what Joseph gave them is beginning to bear fruit. You know, he said, you're going to die. You're going to be delivered. Sure enough, it happened. Do you know that if I'm faithful, I don't immediately see the results of that. I don't know exactly what God's doing, but if I'm faithful, I believe God's going to produce fruit. John 15, Jesus said, herein is my father glorified that we bear much fruit. It is God's desire in our life as a Christian that he would produce something through us. John 15, uh, 16, you have not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatever you should ask the Father in my name, he may give it you. Now, Joseph's duty, he met the demand, I'm here, I don't want to be here, but I'm going to do my duty. Well, the account goes on. We don't just have Joseph's duty, we've got Pharaoh's dream. You go into the next chapter, and you see how this unfolds. Look, if you would, in verse 1. It came to pass at the end of two full years. Now, you know, here the butler leaves, and he's got to think the first week, the butler is going to tell Pharaoh, when he tells Pharaoh that I interpreted that dream, boy, Pharaoh's at least going to want to meet me. He's bound to tell Pharaoh, and he might even bring my case back up, take it up to the appeals court and see if Potter wasn't wrong on this thing. If the butler would just maybe speak a word to Pharaoh or something, I believe he'd have some influence. I know he's going to remember what I told him, and he's going to re- gratitude. A week passes, two weeks pass, a month passes, six months pass. Joseph said, can't count on the butler. I guess I'll just have to do my duty. Well, two full years pass. Joseph doesn't know what's going on behind the scenes. But that uh, Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, in verse 1, he stood by a river. Verse 2, behold, there came out of the river seven well-favored kine, basically cattle, fat-fleshed, and they fed in a meadow. Behold, seven other kine came up after them out of the river, ill-favored and lean-fleshed, and stood by the other kind upon the brink of the river. The ill-favored and lean-fleshed kind did eat up the seven well-favored and fat kind, and so Pharaoh woke up. So you see the picture. you got these nice, well-fed cattle just grazing, and you got these other cattle that come up with their ribs showing, their skinny as can be, and they come over and basically eat the other seven kind, but they still look ill-favored and fat, like they haven't eaten anything. Just a dream. You've had weirder ones than that, no doubt. So he woke up. He slept, and he dreamed the second time. Behold, seven ears of corn came up upon one stalk, rank and good. Behold, seven thin ears, and blasted with the east wind, sprang up after them. The seven thin ears devoured the seven rank and full ears, and Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. Now, Pharaoh is a heathen. He doesn't know God. God is not going to give revelation for mankind through Pharaoh. That's not his intention. But God gave him a dream that actually corresponds and is a prophecy of what he's about to do. Pharaoh is in the position to receive this because he is the king of the largest nation in the world. And God's going to do something through that nation. It affects his people. But he gives him this revelation and it reminds me that God does speak to the heathen. He's got a word for the heathen today. Do you know God speaks through his creation? You know, God's got something to say. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Pharaoh well knew when he had these two dreams, he said, something's about this I need to pay attention to. You know, nobody's going to be without excuse. When they stand before God at the judgment, nobody's going to say, well, now, God, I'm off the hook. Because I never saw a Bible in my life, never went to church, nobody ever told me. Now, they're not going to be as bad off as folks who have directly rejected the gospel, but they still will be without excuse. God has lighted every man that cometh into the world. The, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. He does speak to his creation. You know how else God speaks? God speaks through providence. You know, there are things that happen sometimes, and a person just can't help but stop and say, 
that can't be an accident. I mean, it's just too much of a coincidence. God must be doing something, or somebody bigger than me must have done that. I don't know if you've ever been in a close call in an accident, or maybe you found out right time you went to a, uh, an intersection right behind you, a transfer truck hit the car right behind you, or maybe you uh, were paused in a, in, a, in a traffic jam, and it held you up 10 minutes, and when you showed up where you were 10 minutes earlier, some tragic thing took place. I mean, that happens to people, and a lot of times God allows that to make them think, God's trying to get my attention. You know, I believe, now make sure you don't misquote me or misunderstand me, I believe God can still get people's attention through a dream. Now, he's not going to reveal anything through a dream. He's not going to give you extra revelation from what's in the Bible, but God can still use a dream. He did it too many times in the Bible for me not to think that he still could. I have personally had dreams, and when I woke up from the dream, it made me rethink decisions that I was going to make. I thought, man, that was so real. I, I don't want to be caught in the middle of a cornfield like that with a, uh, you know, uh, somebody with a shotgun on my head or whatever it might be. You know, dreams are just crazy. And you think, man, and now don't, don't get me wrong. Every time you wake up from a dream and, you know, some person you've never seen is your grandfather and you're sitting at the table with a bowl of cornflakes and you're trying to think, oh, I know what that means. Those cornflakes represent, uh, you know, IRS notification I'm going to get or something. I mean, don't try to interpret it, all right? I'm not saying you can interpret the dream like Pharaoh did, but God could still get somebody's attention through a dream. They could wake up and say, boy, I wouldn't ever want to go through that in real life. Maybe I better get right with God. God could still do that. He speaks to people through dreams, but ultimately, he speaks to people through his word. See, even in this account, Pharaoh had a dream, but it wouldn't have done him a bit of good to have that dream if Joseph hadn't have been on the scene. You see, God does speak, but ultimately, what do people need? They need the word of God. Joseph came and gave Pharaoh his word. See, Psalm 19.1 starts off, The heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, night unto night showeth knowledge. That's true. But in verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. It takes God's word for somebody to be saved. So Pharaoh has a dream, but he needs Joseph to come on the scene to give him the word of God. So you've got Joseph's duty, you've got Pharaoh's dream, but then notice in verse 8 of chapter 41, it came to pass in the morning, this is after the dream, that his spirit was troubled. And he sent and he called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told them his dream, but there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. You know what I find about Pharaoh? He's destitute. He's had a dream and he can't interpret it. He knows God's going to do something. He knows, he knows it's meaningful. He's looked at creation and said, boy, this, God's doing something. He's seen the circumstance and said, that just can't be a coincidence. He said, this dream, the same dream twice, one was cows and the other was corn, but kind of a similar theme, man, that's got to mean something. And he's perplexed and he's destitute. Now you see the story unfolding. You've got God's man being faithful. God's holding him back here in reserve. He doesn't know why. He doesn't know what's going to happen. But over here, you've got him working behind the scenes in the heart of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh is in the same place that much of the world is in today. They're perplexed. They're destitute. They do not know what the meaning of life is. They wake up from the dream, as it were. God's trying to get my attention, but I just don't know. I have no direction. Isaiah 57, 21, there is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. A person searching, a person's looking, they're thinking, man, there's got to be more to life than just getting up in the morning, working at a job, whether I like it or don't like. I go back to bed at night, get up, work for five days, party on the weekend, go back to work with a headache on Monday, work all week. Man, there's got to be more to life than this. They're destitute. Or somebody who even lives a clean life and says, man, I try to give money to charity and I try to do right and not swindle anybody and I've made a big old bunch of money in my bank account but I'm empty on the inside. The world's destitute. You know what they need? They need a Joseph to step up, to step up and say, let me tell you what you need. Right. Now, you know what he immediately did? If you notice in verse 8, the world does this. It's understandable. He sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof. And they told him his dream, but there was none that could interpret it unto Pharaoh. Similar thing happened to Daniel, you remember. Hey, I don't really blame Pharaoh for calling his wise men and his magicians. 
That's all he knew to do. But you know what he found is they couldn't give him any real help. You know what the world does today? They look to all different avenues because the devil tries to tell them those avenues are going to help. What do they look to? Why do they look to philosophy? You know, they go to just some type of a modern philosophy. They'll learn there's all kinds of self-help books out there. How to do this, how to do that. Uh, articles online. Uh, there might even be a self-help app. I don't know. Uh, you just I'm looking for somebody to give me some direction. Do you know the world has a new God? Now, they've had it for a while, but this God is becoming more and more prominent. And they're looking to this God for answers, but they're coming up short. And I'll tell you what that God is. It's called science. Now, the Bible calls it science falsely so-called. Because science is actually knowledge. Nothing wrong with real knowledge. But there's this, quote, science today. And if you'll notice the statements that people make about science, they have turned it into a person. They've turned it into somebody to be consulted. I know they're saying it in a general way, but all of a sudden now there's this omniscient, omnipresent, all-powerful, with all the answers, whoever called science. Now it's illustrated right now with all this virus going on, what do they usually say? They don't say the doctor said, or I talked to a physician, or we've studied this. They say, we got to follow the science, as if it's some kind of all-knowing, omniscient uh, this was illustrated the other day, um, the uh, climate person over in California with all these wildfires, they're having a little panel discussion, and uh, he addresses the president, and he says, well, Mr. President, I know you're, you know you're concerned about us clearing out brush and so forth and all of this type of thing, but I hope that you'll realize that we need to follow the science. And the president chuckled. He said, it's going to get cooler again. Just wait. It's going to get cold again. Well, the guy responded. He says, well, that's not what the science says. And the president said, frankly, I don't think the science knows. Well, again, I'm not uh, favoring either one, but it, the guy illustrates the fact that he, whoa, you've just been, just blasphemy. You don't think the science knows? Let me let you in on something. The science doesn't know. Amen. Only God knows. And do you realize today there are people, and we chuckle at this, we think it's funny, they literally think they can consult that if I just found the right intelligent person, I mean, they've been to college, they've got a PhD, they've studied this, it's clinically proven, and they just believe it's true. Now, there are no doubt things that are observable science. There's real knowledge that we can gain by observation, things that we didn't know years before. Uh, we can see it under a microscope, through a telescope, all of that happens, but they think there is just this omniscient thing. And I'm going to tell you, just like Pharaoh, when it comes down to it, has science told you how to have peace in your heart? Has science told you how to keep your kids out of jail? Has science told you how to quit uh, keeping people from killing one another? Science doesn't have the answer. And the wise men and the astrologers didn't have the answer. But an old fella in prison clothes was going to come and give him the answer because he was rightly related to God. God has the answer. Now, Pharaoh had this destitution in his heart, but thank God for destitution when it leads you to the right place. I wonder if we couldn't tonight ask for testimonies and say, how did you get saved? And some of us would say, I was raised in a Christian home. God dealt my heart. I realized I was a sinner and I trusted Christ. And it was just the most natural thing in the world. But others would say, not me. I was up in age, I had God's the last thing on my mind, but I came to a point where God brought me to so low, I had to look up. Amen. Hey, thank God he brought you low so you could look up. That's where Pharaoh is at. So Pharaoh now is destitute, but then we notice Pharaoh is going to be delivered. Look at verse uh, 9 of chapter 41. Then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. Now, two full years, he ain't thought about Joseph. But all of a sudden, he remembered his faults. Now, some of you say, boy, I wish my wife could come to that conclusion. But anyway, he remembered his faults. Who do you think brought that back to his mind? I mean, it didn't just happen by chance. God was waiting two full years, and he said, that's it. September the 23rd, 3 o'clock, bam. Oh, Pharaoh. What am I thinking? I should have thought about this two weeks ago when you said you had a dream. You've been asking all these wise men, and I've just been kind of sitting around thinking about that thing. 
and was trying to get your suit ready and so forth. Man, I was in prison with this guy. And let me tell you the story. And he shares the story. I had a dream. The baker had a dream. He said the baker was going to die. He said the butler was going to live. And sure enough, the baker died. The butler lived. Now, where did that come from? That came from Joseph back when he was faithful and he was diligently doing his work and he was standing for God. He didn't know it, but he went forth with weeping, bearing precious seed. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 13, 4, the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. The soul of the sluggard desires and has nothing but the soul of the diligent. You know, God honors diligence. He honors it with fruit. You know, we go out on visitation for the church. You say, well, he has a whole lot better ways to reach people. Man, there's just so much multimedia and uh, you can just bring your neighbor and all that stuff's good. I, I believe in putting it out on Facebook, media, whatever, inviting your neighbor. But you know why we go out on visitation? We believe these people can be directly reached, and they are. But we go out to be diligent. God told us to go. We go because we believe God will honor it. And you know what happens? You go out and you meet thousands of people out on visitation. Do you know thousands of people that we've touched on visitation with a basket, with a gospel track, with a door hanger, whatever it might be? Well over 95% never came to church, to this one. Now, I don't know how many people read the gospel track. Don't know how God in eternity will know what kind of Fruit might have come from it in different avenues, but as far as them coming to church, most of them did not. But on the other hand, in the last 15 years, as we've gone out and the majority of those folks did not come, you folks did come. You know how you got here? God sent you here. The soul of the diligent shall be made fat. And here's somebody who's maybe been praying for their loved one for years and trying to uh, just trust God to work in their heart. They've been faithful, try to live a testimony, try to give God's word. I don't see the fruit. Well, he didn't see it for two full years, but the day came when the fruit came. Hey, you just be diligent. You be faithful. Let God bring the fruit. Well, he also not only reaped, he relied. Look at verse 16. He's told by, you know, gets his clothes on, comes to see Pharaoh. Pharaoh tells him, you know, I've got a problem here. Nobody can give me the answer. And Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. You know what I need to realize today as a Christian? My job to be an influence on this world to, through the gospel, through my testimony, through trying to be just a blessing. Yes, I'm in the middle of a difficulty. Yes, I'm going through a trial. Maybe I'd like to be somewhere else, but I want to be effective. I want to be faithful. I need to recognize what Joseph said here. It is not in me. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. I need God's help. I need God's power. He relied on God to help him, and he said, God will give you an answer of peace. You know, you've got folks around you that don't know Christ. Do you know you do have help for them? You've got something that can help them. God can give them peace through the gospel. I mean, even those that you may think are just not candidates at all, you can give them the answer of peace. So he uh, relies on God. He reaps from his time of sowing but he also relays. I look in verse 25. Joseph said unto Pharaoh, The dream of Pharaoh is one. God hath showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. Well, then I look down at verse 33. He says, Now therefore let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. You know, he did two things. He first of all gave him the truth, and then he gave him the application. You know, some people are enamored sometimes with just uh, prophecy, the end times. I just want to know what's going to happen. I just want to know the sensational thing. Can you name me the date when Jesus is coming? You know the reason a lot of people want to know the date when Jesus is coming? They just want to know how long they can keep living for themselves until they have to clean things up. Right. I mean, if I if could announce the date that Jesus was coming and it just so happened turned out to be 18 months from now, do you think the majority of people who are not already right with God would say, oh, man, that isn't much time? No, they'd say, oh, man, I think I can probably, I got a good year or whatever. Then we'll think about getting right with God. That's how they view it. Um, prophecy is not there just for sensationalism. God told us what he's going to do so man can respond to it. We're told to preach the word, to be instant in season, out of season, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. 
We've got to be sound in the book, but we have a message from this book. We need to respond to what God says. The truth's not just there to intellectually stimulate me. It's there for me to respond. The God of heaven has spoken to me. I need to do what he says. You know why God speaks to you? You know, if we really tonight just wanted you to come in and say, we just need to have an educational course on the Bible. That's profitable. There's a time for that. But even an educational course on the Bible ought to be because I want to know all I can about what God told me. Why? So I can respond to it. There ought to be a call to respond, to do what God... Joseph didn't just say, I won't just let you know, Pharaoh. Pharaoh, you're going to have seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine. The famine is going to be so bad that the plenty is going to be forgotten. Have a nice day. He actually stepped up and said, Pharaoh, I've not only told you what God's going to do, let me tell you what God expects of you. Get you a wise man, put him over this, and you'll be able to overcome this. And of course, that's when he says, well, I don't know anybody. I've just checked with every wise man in Egypt. They couldn't even tell me what God was going to do. And do you know when it comes down to it, the believer in Christ has more wisdom in his little finger than all the world can accumulate in all their brains. I mean, the Christian really has the best approach to life if he follows this book. Now, the world sometimes will borrow some of it. They'll go to the book of Proverbs and pick out principles that are always true, and they'll find some of these things and use them. But if we know this book and know God, we're in the best shape in the world to help the people who need it. Amen. Now, he relayed the truth, and then finally, you know the end of the story. In uh, verse 33, Now therefore let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise, set him over the land of Egypt. Pharaoh, Let Pharaoh do this, let him appoint officers over the land, and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years. Let them gather all the food of those years that come, and lay up the corn under the hand of Pharaoh. Let them keep food in the cities. And that food shall be for store to the land against the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land perish not through the famine. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? He didn't say a man who's so smart, a man so, who's so intelligent, somebody who's that genius. They said, God's hands on him. You know what Joseph got for all of his faithfulness? He got a reward. He was put in a position to preserve life. And you know, if we are faithful to God, any Christian has that talent. They can be faithful. I'm in a difficult place. I'm in a place I don't like, but I can be faithful. I can do what God has given me to do with what's in front of me right now. It might just be I'm going to be the best employee that I can be and show character and discipline in a, in a, in a world that's not. It might be I'm in a place where people uh, are lewd and I'm going to live uh, holy. It might be that I'm in a family that's uninterested and I'm going to be interested. I mean, whatever it is, we can be faithful and then God, what does he say in Matthew 25 in the, and when God illustrates what the judgment looks like, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things, I'll make thee ruler over many. Joseph reminds us, as a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ in the middle of a difficulty that God calls us to be faithful. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer tonight.